On this edition of Zach Miller Says, we got Tom Dutta. Said like butter with a D. How did I learn that? I asked him how to pronounce his last name. Tom is also an author, and he calls himself the Quiet Warrior. Super excited to be bringing you guys this episode from one of Canada's finest. You guys can learn more about Tom during this episode. And we talk about his story and how writing a book helped him get that story out even more. And we finish with something pretty powerful, talking about when you're looking back on your life, there's three things that you think about a lot, the risk that you take or took, reflection, and how much did you contribute. Without further ado, Tom Dutta, like Butta, the quiet warrior himself. It starts in three, two, one, go! I um, met you because we're both authors under the Morgan James Publishing brand, company, organization, whatever word we want to use. Uh, and I like to meet new people. So I openly always am asking people who wants to be on the show because I think it's a great way to just meet new people um, all across the world. So I'm, I'm super excited to be able to do this. Since uh, I've met you virtually uh, for the first time just a couple minutes ago, and you know we've been following each other for a couple months now, I've noticed that you seem to be reading and reviewing what seems like 300 books a day. <laughs> How are you doing this? Well, uh, first of all, it's an honor to be on the show, and I, you know, I want to just give you a plug. Your book Anomaly is on my list, so <laughs> that one's going to be read as soon as we hang up here. There it is. Uh, I learned a long time ago, and I've had many mentors in my life. This goes to my backstory, but the idea here is that this, you know, I figured out a long time ago that you have to surround yourself by people smarter than yourself. And I came from a very difficult background in my youth, and, you know, my subconscious mind is polluted with a bunch of weeds instead of seeds. And, and one of my mentors, gosh, about 15 years ago, Tony Robbins, uh, after taking one of his programs, Zach, I got a list from him and he said, I read 100 or 200 books. And that's when I started reading and I realized that if I fill myself up with greatness from people like uh, Zach Miller and others, that's going to basically rewire my subconscious, going to give me you know, things that I, I don't know. And then in corporate America, where I, I worked for about 30 years in my career, Zach, every board of directors or every leader I had always would tell me, here's my here's my top reading list. And they would give you a bunch of books to read that they wanted you to read so you could understand the culture they're trying to create in the company. So I've been a lifelong reader, but I was joking with you before we got on here that I get bored reading and uh, my, my eyes bounce all over the page. My dad had that issue. So I'm an audiobook guy too. And I found a little trick in my PDF uh, app. I can turn it on and have the book read to me. <laughs> so, so that's why I read a lot. So it's not voiced by the author. It's actually just some tool that kind of reads it and then pushes it out. Yeah, it's actually pretty amazing. I stumble on it and you can choose an American voice of uh, a woman or a man and you can turn it up to 200 percent. And that's what I do because it speed reads and, uh, you know, we can pick up a lot of stuff. So typically if I'm reading like your book, Zach, I'll be in the kitchen cooking. I'll be on the treadmill. I'll be doing something that's passionate or something that I like. And I'll just use multitask, right? I'll, I'll use that extra time and, uh, and, and do that. I, I can get through a book in about a day. What's the, what's the app? Yeah, well, you, you've heard of Adobe, yeah. the PDF. PDF. Uh, the app that reads my standard PDF files, it's got that on it. And it appears as a little microphone, so you have to find it in the toolbar. Wow. And, and I only discovered that about... You know, six months ago, up until then, I was like page flipping every book. It was crazy. Yeah. So you also then review a lot of these books. Are, are you being genuine with the reviews? Because it seems like there's a lot of five stars. Like, not that those books aren't worth five stars, but like, how are, how are you, what's your rubric for a rating system? Yeah. Well, first thing I got to tell you is that, you know, I'm a new author, so uh, you know, I've looked at a lot of author reviews and I've seen ones. And I also, in corporate America, when I was an employee, I used to get performance ratings. And I also you always used to have bosses who would rate you three or four, you know, and when I was in a CEO type role. And they would have these belief systems and rules. And I had one boss once who said something stupid. I said, you know what? My performance is worth an, a five. 
And he said, yeah, but I just never give that out because it was his own belief system that was wired that there's no such thing as perfection. So when I started doing reviews, I just, you know, I may be just off the top of my head here as a new author, Zach, but first of all, is Morgan James, the publisher, what I've gotten to know is that they only bring on high quality authors. You know, 5,000 manuscripts arrive there. They pick maybe a couple hundred a year. So I thought, you know, there must be good quality stuff. And, and uh, the second thing is I only pick a title that's interesting to me that lights my heart, sets my heart on or my soul on fire, I guess. And so, yes, I rate them highly because I believe that every book I've read has had something come out of it that's actually changed my life in some way. And when I have those breakthroughs or aha moments, I, you know, if it's a five, if it's a four, I'll rate it a four. I don't think I've ever gone below a four. And by the way, if I, I believe that if an author wants to rate a book low, you know, we're all in the same community courtesy is I should reach out to Zach and say, here's the review I'm going to give you. It's not, it's going to be a stinker and here's why, you know, maybe we should talk about that before I post it up there. You can uh, post my two star. It's okay. I'll <laughs> take it all day. I, I that really, makes it, that makes it authentic by the way, the two stars. I, I get that too. Yeah. You know, look, uh, my book, um, is very much a baseline book. So to some people, it might be stuff that they had learned years before, but I found that the majority of the people that I work with don't have a fair baseline of yep. what they need to do from a marketing perspective or to stand out in positioning. And that was who the book was written for. And so, you know, some people might say, oh, it's, it's, it's not deep enough, whatever. That's fine. Like, yeah, exactly. Still get something out of it. Just like you said, like if you can get one little nugget then it was probably worth it. I mean, what's 20 bucks, right? Um, but I love what you were talking about with that rubric there where, like, what is the rubric, right? Because Yelp, you know, what's five stars? What's this? There is there is no rubric. So this one guy yeah. just doesn't give five stars because he doesn't. And so how have you kind of classified or created your rubric to decide in things in general, not necessarily just rating a book, but like wh what do you determine as a five uh, and what's what's a one? Well, if I, first of all, the author, or if I'm talking about a book, it's the author is, it has to be authentic. So in other words, you know, to me, somebody who's authentic doesn't show up with their ego. So if I read a book where the author is writing authentically, they're talking about vulnerability. They're talking about the challenges and the issues along the journey. And it's not just look how great I am and, uh, you know, look at all things I've accomplished. So one is authenticity. Um, the other bar would be, uh, it, like I said, it has to, it has to impact my soul. So I'm a guy who came from roots where my, my soul had a hole in it. So if I find books that make a deep impact on me and, uh, give me something that I didn't know, you know, then to me, that's the next bar for a four or five rating. And, uh, the third one is, does, does the book, is the book written to make an impact on the universe? Is it going to do something? We can get into my book in more detail too, but my, my, I always said I wanted to write a book, Zach, since I was a kid. In fact, when I was in high school, I used to write poetry and I wrote my first poem and it was called A Brave Dime. It was actually the story of this cash register in a store and all the, the money was sleeping in the cash register and it was dark and this bad guy broke in to steal the, the money. And uh, there was a dime in the cash register. He jimmied it open, he got out and all the, all the other coins got out. And I remember writing that and I got an A plus from my teacher and she says, you know what, Tom, you got some creativity here. Throughout my life, I've wanted to write, but what was holding me back was really me. I was afraid of writing a book. I was always afraid of what people would think of me. I, and the biggest thing is I didn't have my why. I didn't know why I was going to write the book. So when, you know, when an author writes a book, if I can understand what its purpose is and the why behind it, you know, that also is part of me giving it a four or five rating. It's really interesting to hear that about kind of like you afraid to not only write the book, but afraid of what other people think about you. Um, I, I think we're, and I don't know if we're taught this, if it's a society thing, if it's a family thing, but like, I feel like we're not, we don't embrace to be ourselves and we really care what other people think. Um, yeah. and I, and I feel like that, that, that's a bad thing, right? Like some people don't, I'm a, I feel like I'm a very genuine person. Uh, and I very much try to be who I am at all times. And, and 
to me, that can even be like in the way that you dress. So I generally wear like jeans and a black t-shirt, right? Yeah. Like that is my uniform, if you will. That's my suit. Some people hate it. <laughs> And I actually get crap for it. And I'm just like, why, like, why does this matter? Like, why, why are you judging me because of yeah. that? And so how did, knowing that that was something that you feared so much and writing a book is, you know, not an easy feat. How did you start getting off of that? Because, I, you know, I, years yeah. of being pushed around cannot be a necessarily a yeah. positive thing. Yeah, no, you know, absolutely. Well, are you ready for the story? Because maybe I'll just tell you the backstory that that led to me writing the book. That's probably the best way. Eh? Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Canadian. So I have to say a, a few times in the dialogue. I love here. It. I love it. We just, we just came off our Thanksgiving and I'm so grateful for so many things and you're one of them. Uh, so I'll just take you back. When people ask me to introduce myself, Zach, I'll usually, I used to say, and this is 20 years ago. I, my name is Tom Dutta. I'm a CEO and I build and grow companies. I've worked on both sides of the border, you know, five different sectors. And uh, this is my company and what I do. And then I discovered my real self. So when I introduce myself now, which I'm going to do, it, it's a bit of a story. So I'll take you right back. I was born the son of immigrant parents. My mom and dad were from Fiji. My grandparents were from India. And, uh, you know, my father died this January, so it's been an adjustment year for us. Uh, but my dad, he was in the military. He was a commanding officer with the British Army. Uh, we were, I was born on a military base in the U.K., and my father, when he was younger, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he was with the Mormon church. And, you know, here I was born into the world and on a military base at age f a few years later, traveled to our country, Canada, well, mostly because my parents said my uncle here said it's a better place to raise children. And here's the thing. My father was a choir boy, but then he became a pretty bad dude. My dad was a violent man. He was a, a sloppy drunk. He passed out on the lawns of others. He had many adulterous affairs in our home. Uh, he hit me. He hurt me. I was the black and blue kid. And I, w I always like to say when I tell this story, and I remember Tony Robbins told me on stage one day when I worked with him, he said, never tell your bullshit story again. He said, if you're going to tell that story, tell it to help people. So that story, I thought it was the only story I had. And, you know, I thought it ruled my life. And the good news is, is I sur survived all that you know, up till my mid teens and I left home and went into corporate America. And as I got into corporate America, I started climbing the ladder and I chose a path into financial services in the banking, mostly because I had mentors who said, you know, you're pretty smart and that's probably where you should start. Well, I climbed the corporate ladder and I'll be quick on this, but I was a manager at age 21 and a CEO by the age of 31. And I thought, wow. And, you know, I had this vision of being a CEO, <laughs> quite frankly, I didn't know what it was. I just, thought I'd want to be one. And this was in a large public company, about a $290 billion company. And I ran a piece of it up here in Canada. And I had a board of directors in the US. And anyway, that's all just details. But here's the thing. When I got up to that CEO role, I started, my wife said to me, my second wife, who's I'm married to now 23 years, she's amazing. She's Anna. She's uh, Italian. She says, Tom, she says, you, we got a nice home and we've got everything you need. And she says, you know, you're a good looking guy, I think. And she says, but you're just not, you don't look happy. And I discovered then, Zach, that there was something missing I was seeking. And I didn't know what it was. And, you know, I, every time I achieved more, it just didn't come. What I realized is that I was still searching for something that was missing. And it related back to my past childhood. So writing the story forward, you know, I went through the first third of my career and how many people get on your show and say I was a, a flawed character. I was an effed up flawed character. I mean, in fact, in leadership, I was winning awards because in corporate America, they reward you for achieving. I was driving teams hard. I was getting shit done. But I couldn't really have relationships very well with some people. And I was flawed. And uh, and so I got to that point in my life and, I, you know, some significant events happened and I decided to go on a a journey. I call it the hero's journey. I guess to really, you know, figure out what was miss, missing and, and, and discover the hole that was in my soul from when, when I was a kid. And there's a saying in leadership that, and when I coach people, because I coach taught leadership people, that uh, what happens in the past manifests itself in present day leadership. So in other words, you could be sitting in a meeting like this with me and you, Zach, and you could be maybe an aggressive guy who is in your face, kind of opinionated. And my brain would say that guy looks a lot like my dad. 
and I would start subconsciously blocking you or doing things. So I was having these challenges in, in leadership and I got a coach and she broke me. I was in a boardroom one day and this was in my CEO role and she said, I'm going to follow you around for a month. And she did and she took notes and she sat down with me and she said, you got a lot of great things. You're turning this company around. That's what we hired you for. Tom, a lot of people like you, but she said, there's some issues. And some of the feedback, it was stung. And they say when you get that kind of feedback, Zach, you kind of you kind of get whacked and you run to your cave. And some people deny it and some people accept it. But I'll get into more of that later. But, you know, I, I decided something had to change. So I went on a journey for about eight years and I had a lot of mentors. I did a lot of self-work, things I never thought I would do. And that journey started because of three major events in our life. And uh, you guys had the, a familiar down in the in America with the subprime uh, debacle that happened. Well, in 2007, well, I'm going to bring you forward now in life from the childhood. In 2007, I woke up one day and we we had uh, a, a beautiful home. My net worth was a couple million dollars. I was a chief executive officer. My, my wife was a bank manager. Combined, we had a fairly significant income. My two boys were in their teens. My daughter was in her grade school. We had nice cars. We had a home at the lake. I mean, I'm an immigrant son. My dad was an electrician. My uncle was a plumber. So I grew up with not much. But I worked my ass off to get to where I was, and so did my wife. We woke up one day, and all that disappeared. We were caught in the largest Ponzi scheme. Uh, it was actually a billion dollars globally. And so everything we had, we lost our house. We lost all of our retirement funds. We literally woke up with nothing. And right about that time, my wife's mom had a major stroke. And her and I talked. And based on my CEO job, she said she started leaving work. And, the, and she started getting in shit from the, pardon my language, by the way, but she started getting heck from the, the bank. And I said, you know what? Based on my quarter million dollar paycheck, why don't you just look to take a leave of absence? So she retired. And they gave her a big check for 22 years of work. That all went in the, in the fraud. So we woke up and we had the death of a parent. We had the loss of everything. And one month after the Ponzi scheme hit, my company reorganized because in corporate America, I like to say nobody looks after you. You got to create your own future. And through a merger, my job was eliminated with my executive team. So we went from everything to nothing. And we never told my family. My kids didn't know. We were selling the house and literally living in quiet desperation. So that's where it started. I went on the journey. And I remember saying to Anna, you know what? There's there's something missing. There's a reason for what's happened in her life. I got to go and we got to go and discover that. So as she looked after nursing her mom and then burying her, I went and did a whole bunch of weird stuff. I could have easily gone back. They say, Zach, that when we get downsized from a job or something, we get back up and we go right back into the same thing. It's because what we know. And uh, I read something on your website about your book, Anomaly. I was blown away because it said something, in fact, and I may get this wrong, that you were making $100,000 and you're in a certain career and you're doing some things and it just wasn't where you wanted to be. And, and so you recreated yourself and, and then you brought those gifts to others. So I started going on this discovery. And, you know, I did weird things. I went and applied for a real estate license to be a commercial real estate broker. I figured sell a few big buildings and I'll maybe make a big paycheck. And remember, I had – my wife was 10 years away from her retirement age, if there's such a thing, and I'm 10 years younger than her. And I remember freaking out going, what I did in 20 years, I have to get that back. I have to build back our finances. I have to put my daughter through university. And I was supporting my mom, and I had bought a place for her to stay, and that went too. The family turned against me. It was very difficult. So some of my mentors included guys like Tony Robbins I mentioned and uh, a whole list of them. But once I finished the journey, I learned a bunch of things about myself and the biggest pieces were it was related back to my child. And this goes back to something you said, which I thought was brilliant in that sometimes we feel we're not enough. And uh, you know this, Zach, I'm sure from you, from what you've done, but 50% or more of what is wired in us isn't even true. We come into the world with 2 million neurons in our heads as babies, and they start wiring thoughts and emotions. And all of a sudden, you know, this crust builds up on us, and we forget about the fact that we're born, born golden, as Joe Campbell taught me. And, and that's who we are, and we lose sight of that. So going back to the book, I, uh, I went to Holland, Michigan, which is a great place in America, and I went there because a buddy of mine said, you need to go and meet a guy named John. And the first thing I said is, oh, great, another guy. <laughs> I 
I've already been and talked to a whole bunch of guys and did a, done a whole bunch of things. I even did network marketing for nine, uh, five years and became a diamond distributor and won trips and cars and got my income up to ten grand a month and met a lot of broken, interesting people there. So I, I'll, I'll go see this guy. So this guy's name was John. And I said, why should I go see this guy? And they said, well, it's going to cost you a bunch of money. So it was a bunch of money, U.S., which is like a million in Canada. So I paid about seven grand and I got on a plane and I didn't know what to expect. And I went to see the guy. And uh, the guy met me for dinner. So you, you can picture I'm getting off the plane. I'm at this little airport in Holland, Michigan. And this black SUV drives up, almost like what your presidents get driven around in. And there's a guy at the bottom of the escalator wearing a black cap. He's in dark skin. He's got a little thing up that says Dutta. And I went, I've made it. <laughs> Nobody's ever picked me up like that. And for a day, I can be a president. My name was on this board. And I thought, this is pretty cool. It's an expensive so I went limo ride. Expensive winter, exactly. So I anyway, I went to the hotel, and next thing you know, John, he comes, picks me up, and he walks me upstairs into a restaurant, and it, it's dusk out, and the restaurant is nicely lit with the candles, and there's this woman with him and his assistant from his company. And I said, what, what are we going to do? And he said, I just want to talk to you. He said, tell me your story. What do you do? And through the conversation, I won't get into the whole thing for sake of time, but you know what? There was a We had a drink in our hands. I don't drink a lot because my dad was an alcoholic, but I had, a, I think, a martini, and John says, tell me about the man, Tom, what's behind him? And he says, what do you do? And I said, well, I just, I'm an executive and I've been doing that all my life, making millionaires in other companies. And I said, I, I said, my mom told me a long time ago, Zach, that people just want to talk to me. They want to be around me. And when I was coaching teams or working with people, there was that element where people just wanted to share their stuff as part of my personality type. So I said, I just quietly go along and I help people, I guess like a warrior, and he, he stopped me and he said, hold on to that. I don't know if that's going to be the title of your new book, but The Quiet Warrior might have something to do with your new book. So I went, okay. So the next day we basically spent a day together. I call it the blender. He had a whiteboard. And this is what the program was. And he took 30 years of wisdom out of my head and we, we mapped it out into the business model for my company. And so I came back home and when I got off the plane, I was depressed. And I'll tell you why, because as I was leaving, he gives me a book and it's a great book and it's called Thought Leaders. And he says, you need to write a book. And I said, oh, OK. He says, read this. I said, what's a thought leader? I thought I knew what it was, Zach, but a thought leader is, as you know, somebody has a niche, especially and the, the universe calls on them to share their thoughts and you know move people. So I get home and I didn't know how to write a book. I had no money. I was broke at that time. And uh, so I was pretty resourceful. I go on LinkedIn and I put in the word author and Bob pop, pop, pops 10 authors. And I picked the first author in the list and her name was Kamal. And as I clicked it, the first book of her, a page of her book opened up and it shocked me. I actually was horrified reading it. And as I read it, I went, oh my God, I've got to meet this woman. And so I stalked her. I stalked her through, uh, through LinkedIn and she finally let me in after about four weeks of stalking her. Uh, she met me at a Starbucks not far from where I live in what's called Guilford. I mean, you can picture on that day, Zach, I'm in Starbucks. I got a black tee on with a blazer, a pair of jeans, and I'm sitting, I get my coffee. I'm sitting in the end of the Starbucks looking at the door, and this door opens. There's this woman. She walks in. She's kind of about my mom's height, 5'4", dark skin, sits down, and she starts talking to me, and she says, it's nice to meet you. She says, I don't meet men like you very often. And I said, okay. She said, well, you'll know why in a minute. So she said, lean forward and look at my face. And as I looked at her face, it looked like the elephant man, but I was on a woman. And she said, I have seven plates of metal in my face. She said, because he broke it seven times. And she said, look at these slits beside my eyes. She said, that's where he put his fingers and tried to gouge my eyeballs out. And she began to tell me the story about she was a woman who was in an arranged Indian marriage. Her husband beat the heck out of her over many years, broke her jaw and tried to murder her. In fact, she had two young children. He poured gasoline on her and tried to set her on fire. And she's written her first book on it. And that's, and I said to her, I said, why did you write your book? She said, Tom, because it's the only way I could keep living. I had to turn my, my story into a gift to go out and help the world. And then she says to me, she said, I know your story because you and I have talked a bit and I've learned. She said, Tom, you need to sell your story. And I said, why? She said, because no man in North America, particularly in the Indian community, will ever stand on stage and talk about their violence in their life, talk about being a, you know, a victim of abuse. She said, they just won't do it. 
because North America doesn't uh, applaud that. And so she said, what I want you to do, and this was the end of the story there. She said, I want you to go and start writing. She said, you got to write your book. And she said, I will mentor you. I don't have any money. But she said, you send me the pages. I'll I'll talk to you about it. So, Zach, I went home and I was still depressed because I said, okay, I can start writing, but I don't have any money. And uh, so she kept texting me every couple of weeks saying, okay, are you writing? And I was lying to her. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I've started. I've started. Make a long story short, I called up John, my guy. I said, John, I want to, I met this woman, Kamal, and I'm going to write my book. I said, I think the book is going to be the story of how my life, I turned those demons into gifts and how it held me back in my business career. And I made some character shifts and came back as a, as somebody who could help other people, uh, be, be, be stronger leaders, be more happy. I said, but I don't know how good about doing it. So John introduced me to a few people and, uh, one was a, uh, a, a woman who wrote books, but she wrote fictional books because I knew how to write business, but not fiction. And so the co- series of conversations, we end up deciding to write the book as a fable and a hybrid fable in a business book. And the characters, so there's six chapters, Zach, of uh, fictional stories. The first chapter is called The Boy, and it'll rock you because it's hard to read. It's about me. And then so we go fictional chapter, and then the next chapter is business, and which is this one of the phases of my coaching program that I developed, which is really the journey I took to fix myself and become uh, happy again. And so we said, we're going to write it that way. And then the last conversation was, I remember phoning up you know, my book team and saying, when I was in corporate America, Zach, they used to call me Tommy Gun. I don't know if you've heard of the term, the, uh, the uh, hired gun. But basically anybody they hire to come in, boards will hire us to make change. Our lifespan and the roles we, uh, we do are usually three to five years. And we go into companies and we'll, sometimes we'll clean up bad situations, maybe right size downsides. Maybe we'll clean up uh, poor performance or toxic cultures. So I love doing that work because I got to recreate stuff, but they called me Tommy Gunn. And, uh, and so I went on, when I went on my journey of eight years and came back, I came back as the quiet warrior. So we gave me the brand of the quiet warrior. So I started as Tommy Gunn, the hired gun executive who kind of had this broken soul and stumbled his way to success, but you know, still couldn't figure out what it meant. And I came back after my journey, my hero's journey, I call it to with the, the handle of the quiet warrior and it stuck. So when we finished the book, uh, we went into a studio and did a photo shoot and I have a professional photographer and he said, bring your leather jacket and bring five sets of business clothes. And we did about a thousand photos and, uh, he's a local guy here. He's a young guy and he's award winning too. And, uh, my wife was with me cause she's half of my company. We founded the company together and he said, put on your leather jacket. And I want to see your badass pose. <laughs> so, so I did some poses, and the picture that you see on the cover of my book is actually my badass photo. And here's the interesting thing, going back to what you said, which was brilliant, that I used to think I wasn't enough. I used to think I was a bit of a loser. I was a fat kid. I was overweight. My, my, my dad used to call me names. I was bullied in school because of the color of my skin. I'm South Asian, Hindu, raghead, you, call, you name it. I had a boss when I was in my first uh, manager job that referred to me in public as the token nigger of the company. So I'm not telling you all this to make you feel for me, but I was wired to think that I was there's something wrong with me. But I didn't know that anybody else had anything wrong with them. I thought that's just my story. But I was always a fighter. I was a survivor. I had something in me. I was a winner. I knew there was greatness within me and nobody was going to put me down. So I just kept fighting forward. And when the book came out, and we put the cover together and we, re- we released the book, uh, it changed my life. And why I was afraid of writing it was because I ex- exposed my story in the beginning of the book. The book's not a woe is Tom. The boy is one chapter. And when you're done, it's like, okay, I get it. And then it builds on that into how did Tommy go from being the, the abused kid, the kid who felt he was enough, who struggled with relationships, and how did he get to where he is uh, to change something and become more character. How did he get through that? And that's that's what my book is all about. It's about transformation. Hmm. The word warrior is very powerful, and I, and I love the kind of genesis of how that came together. When did Morgan James 
come into this? Where, ha, had the whole book been written at that point? Did you pitch it yeah. to them early? How did how'd you, how'd yeah, you we, meet them? Stuff like that. Yeah, so if I just go back in my mind here, because I'm thinking about timelines, I wrote the book. I wrote the book over the about three months, three or four months in 2000. And, and we had we said a, there was a bigger picture behind it. I actually did a work for a year to develop the brand of my company, Create, and the business model. And the book was the calling card. It was going to be the calling card for the company. And so I actually put a stake in the ground on the calendar. I said, November 2016, I have to have this book in hard copy in my hands. And I, what I did, Zach, is I went down to what's called the Terminal City Club in Vancouver, which is a one of the world's business clubs. And I booked a room called the President's Room. And this is how I learned from Tony, just get stuff done. Just go put a stake in the ground and manifest it. So I booked this room, and I remember my wife and I went and toured it, and I said, I'm going to have 100 people in that room. I'm going to pre-release my book in November. So we spent a few thousand dollars. We got everything lined up, started writing the book in the through the summer, uh, finished the manuscript, met Morgan James through a connection, again, through just through my networking, never knew who they were, uh, fell in love with their model because they were challenging the system of traditional publishing. And I'd heard a lot of bad stories, Zach. I mean, I'm the kind of guy in my my career who used to go to conferences and meet authors who would give me their books. I hear all the horror stories about having to buy tons of books and losing a lot of money. And one author told me that their manuscript, the author, the, uh, the editor at the publisher wanted 40,000 changes made. And so when I saw Morgan James was recreating publishing, I thought, okay, I don't have time for that crap. I got a deadline. So I met them. They 40,000 the page or 40,000 changes. I mean, <laughs> 40,000 changes. And now either the guy was a terrible writer or, you know, this was a control freak publisher. Anyway, I, when I met Morgan James, I remember having a conference call to meet the founder. And when I heard his story about how his life came from here to here and he did some really crazy things, I went, first of all, I liked the owner. But then I discovered that I didn't really know what I was doing. So honestly, it could have been any publisher. And I, if I didn't have an alternative, I might have gone there. But I fell in love with the fact that you're in the driver's seat, uh, which I was. I had a phone call with them in uh, mid-2016. And then we got it done. It was literally under the wire late November. We early released the digital copy in uh, spring of 2017. And then pub publishing day was July 4th. And I never forget it. That day that we launched at the Terminal City Club, I had a big screen. We did a bit of a, a launch of my brand of the company and the 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 way the quiet work coaching program I developed. And then we did the how, the second half of the the reveal meeting it was about half an hour, all about the book. And the image of the book was on the screen, and I talked about it. And the room was quiet. And we actually staged the room. We got these uh, things that made the, the the ceiling look like the sky you know, these stargazers, and we had some of the interesting lighting and music, and it was all about being the freak flag. It's about being different. And uh, guess who came to the launch? And I get emotional saying this. I have to make sure I don't tear up here. But the woman, Kamal, that woman who inspired me to write the book, uh, she came and she talked, and she said nice things about me and my book, and then she gave me a hug. And uh, today I call her the sister I never had. I never had a sister. And... Uh, and, and, and she stayed at my side the whole time. So I guess if there's one nugget I can tell you about writing a book is maybe a couple is when I discovered my purpose behind it, which was to be the calling card to my business. Uh, and then the second one is to connect to my why, to something deeply personal that drives me. No matter what people say, even if somebody writes a one-star review, it doesn't matter because that's my story, man. I mean, I've been put down and talked about in so many ways. It doesn't matter. I'm a five. I mean, I wake up today, and this may sound arrogant, but I wake up and I love myself first. I say, I am great. I used to wake up, and I used to not feel that way. And they say people who get up in the morning and can love themselves first before they go out into the world, those people who don't wait for somebody to pat them on the back or give them a big paycheck, those people have character. They're the happiest people. And, and you can't be in service to other people unless you can love yourself first. So... So the whole journey with the book has been just a blessing. And people ask me, did you make money off it? And I'll usually say the same thing all authors know. You don't make a lot of money off writing books. In fact, many authors don't sell a lot of books. I read that in Morgan James, uh, 
marketing work. They gave me that. Bill Clinton said his book never sold because he didn't market it. But my book's connected to my business model. So in the first year, my ROI was 300%. I made uh, a lot of money off of the programs and things that I sell in my business. And also, we got a call from Moving America Forward, a, a, a TV show in America, and we got called to Hollywood to do a TV show. So we shot that, and I used that as a marketing video. And uh, I got published in a few magazines. I, I got my story and business published in Innovators Magazine. So we started getting all this free publicity simply over a single thought. I don't know if you like music, Zach, but one of the favorite musicians I love, I play guitar, and one of my favorite musicians is Yanni, if you've ever heard his music. The guy's amazing. Like he's gone into the Forbidden City, all these places like the Taj Mahal, and he's and he's he's from Greek, and uh, he's gone through a tough life too. Uh, but I remember he was playing in a concert here at the Orpheum Theater in Vancouver. My astonishing wife Anna was sitting beside me, and we're watching this. And he stops the orchestra, and he said, and he starts introducing the next song, and he said, "Every single thing on this planet started from a single thought, and it's the same seed I've had in my head since." I've met Tony Robbins and people like Napoleon Hill, all these mentors that all you, everybody has a thought. There should be more people who write books, but if you can, if you, if you, if you can't turn that thought into, if you can't manifest it into a physical equivalent because something's inside you is holding you back, fear or whatever, then you'll never write it. So all of this, where we are today with the book and the company and the work I'm doing, and, and quite frankly, this whole journey saved my life, all of that. Uh, started with a single thought, which came from those three pretty difficult events that I told you about. Mm. I'm a firm believer, that's why we're talking, um, to just say hey, right? To just just say hello to someone, right? And, and introduce yourself. You never know where that relationship can go. Uh, actually, before we started talking, I was at a lunch um, with two people who had bought my book, and so I, I signed it. Um, and I... Um, I try and write something that's on brand, but very personal at the same thing. And so, um, one of the relationships was with the uh, restaurant owner, um, where we were eating lunch. And I just said, I'm, I'm glad that we like reached out to each other yeah. because where would we be if, if, you know, if I didn't do that. And so it, it, it brings me back though to, to Camilla right? Like you were so persistent in that and it became such a powerful relationship in your life. But so many people will basically bitch and complain about how, oh, I can't have this. I don't do this. But what, what the heck have you done to even get anything? Right? You, I, I, people don't even reach out to people and they're like, well, why didn't, why didn't this work out? Well, you didn't put any effort into it. Right? Like the girl I married, it literally took me three months to get her to even go on basically a date with me. <laughs> She was right. worth it. Man. <laughs> well, clearly it was worth it. Right. But like, and I, and I joke about that with people. And actually I, there's parts of my book where I'm like, if you use this uh, kind of technique, you can get it to get a girl on a date with you. Like persistence <laughs> is important. I'm not saying to nag and be that annoying cable salesperson, but not everything happens immediately. Right. And yeah. for four, four, six weeks, something like that, like you had to keep nagging her. You had to keep being persistent. And then finally, it wasn't you though. Right. It was, she didn't want to come out because she, even though had gotten that message out, you know, the, the plates in her face, the seven, uh, and then the, the lines from her eyes, like that was very powerful for her to come out but that relationship that you guys created, you can, I, I can just hear how powerful and meaningful that's become. And I, I can think of everything big that's ever happened in my life. It's because I've raised my hands because I've just yeah. said, Hey, right. Yeah. And I'm a very, very big believer, which it sounds like you are too. And in, in introducing yourself to people, just saying, hello, it doesn't, you don't even know who it could be. It could be someone just on walking down the street. Yeah. Right. Everyone yeah. that walks by, try and say hello. And the, literally people are like why do you do that i said what it's just nice to do that right some people say hello back some people look at me like i'm crazy <laughs> uh, and sometimes i start conversations with people it, it's just it's it's very powerful so I, I love that you do that you mentioned a couple of minutes ago that i believe tony robbins said don't tell me that that bs story what was the bs story in there that you were telling yeah 
Okay, so let me get it. Let me cover that, and then if you don't mind, I want to just go back because you sent me on a journey in my mind to a different place when you just said about networking. Um, so my bullshit story, and you know what? I'm just going to be transparent because it's the way I am. You have a bullshit story. Everybody has a bullshit story. When people come to me and I start working them, one of the things I read in your anomaly overview, which was I haven't read the book, but I saw your website that had some stuff about it, was that you got to be different to stand out, and. So my story isn't any better than anybody else's story. In fact, I could be sitting here right now and I could have no arms and legs because I was they were blown off in Afghanistan or something. And that's my story. And the the thing I'm trying to say about everybody has a story is that our souls were born golden, but we have this crust that builds up, as I said. And whether it's going bankrupt, having a partner rip you off, going through a divorce, losing a child, getting whacked in your performance review from a boss who's a narcissist and you can't shed that, we all have a story. But here's the interesting thing about that, that I was telling my story to whoever would listen as I was growing up and as I went into my career for pity. Woe is me. No, I, I didn't get that promotion because look what my dad did to me. I didn't get this happen in my life. It's, my marriage has fallen apart. My first marriage, by the way, lasted seven years, not because of her. I discovered it was because of how it was showing up. And so that so people go through life and they use their bullshit story as an excuse for why they can't be enough. And so when we change that story, because you probably, I know you know this, because words matter. So we can't have a positive thought and a negative thought at the same time. And Einstein left us with a, an amazing thought that I believe he said something like, the future lies in our imagination. We can dream, and that lies in a part of the brain. So when we're telling our BS story, Zach, which is usually negative crap, we can't actually dream and imagine. We can't dig ourselves out and create the future, create that new neuropath, that new thought process that I'm enough, I'm, I'm great. So I'm glad you asked me that because I, I for, I'm going to tell you now what the new meaning of my dad's, my life with my dad is. And uh, this is where I got to with Tony's work. My, my bullshit story used to be, woe is me, life never worked out because I was an abused kid and my father was an alcoholic, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> My new story is this. My purpose in life is, a, is based on my father. The, my father's demons became gifts from God that gave me a power that nobody else has on the planet to go out and help other people be happier and be more successful. And sometimes when I tell, I have a couple brothers, by the way, and they're not far along in their journeys, not as far along as me, and there's a lot of bad blood between them and my dad. And I hate to say this, but we had a rough time with my dad's estate because one of my brothers was estranged from my dad like I was, but I hadn't taken the journey and my other brother is very angry. And when I did the eulogy at the funeral in February, my brother's chickened out. And so my both my one's a year older and one's younger and they both asked me to do the eulogy and I went, holy crap, out of the three of us, I was the one who was the black and blue kid. They, they, they saw and dealt with some of the same stuff, but not the way I did. And I said, you guys want me to do the eulogy? So I, I stood up there and I did the eulogy of my dad and you know what? I, I honored my dad, Zach. I said the things I knew when he was younger, when I was younger, but I also told the people about how he went in, when my dad got sober. So my dad was he was sober for 22 years when he died. He went into AA and uh, he went into prisons and started helping people. And I was estranged from him for 10 years. I orphaned him and for my daughter. But what I did at the, the eulogy was I honored him. I would say things like, I love my dad. And what my dad gave me were gifts that today have made me stronger, but made me more successful and made me somebody that can go out into life and help so many people, especially business leaders who, by the way, Zach, most business leaders show up with blood on their shirts. And this goes back to what you said about networking. I know this is kind of a weird loop, but you had me think about this, that you're a brilliant networker. I get that from what you, you said, and I see that on your body of work. I never used LinkedIn until 10 years ago, and today I have thousands of direct connections, and everybody says that, that you're you're just naturally somebody who can pick up the phone or connect to people. But one of the things I brought into my business was science, motive, uh, personality science, and I used some tools that helped me figure out what your motive is. So what's the why behind Zach's behavior? That's why I want some of the work I do in my coaching is different. So when I meet leaders or people, I'll explain to them and find out what their motives are. And I'll say something like, by the time I'm done with you, you're going to know more about why you do what you do than you've ever known before. 
So in that, in that world, there's four types of personalities. We're, we're not going to go deep on this today, I know. But uh, 50% of people are wired to resist being vulnerable and wired to not pick up the phone or not want to network and meet other people. There's many reasons for that. Some of it is their innate gifts are not. Uh, some people have fear. Uh, their motive is peace, so they have fear of actually engaging in conversation. Other people are what we call the motive of power. They're, they get up in the morning to get things done, and they don't have time to develop intimate relations with people. I've worked with bosses who will never say, how is your daughter's birthday? It's, it's like, I need that report tomorrow. But me as a leader, I might say, I need that report tomorrow, Zach. But by the way, hey, your son's birthday was on the weekend. Tell me about that, even though we're busy. So what I'm getting at is... It's like humanizing things? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what I'm, I'll bring this together, put a bow on it. About 50% of the people on the planet are wired not to be comfortable with networking. And this is where what you said is so cool. In the work I do, in order to become a charactered person, and there's some good research now that says that leaders or people who run companies are going to be selected more by their character than their skills. So if you can develop something in yourself that's not innate, say you're, 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 you're fearful of meeting people or you're so busy you'd never make time to go and have those coffees, if you can develop that, make a shift and add that strength in your personality, you become what we call charactered. And so just like I was able to uh, develop the strength of being more assertive because my father was a command and control military guy and a, and a, and a violent guy, uh, I developed the strength of being more assertive and setting boundaries. I also had a limitation of, uh, of worrying all the time about stuff. So it, I wasn't always that master networker. I was worrying too much about stuff to even make time to do that. So, yeah, I mean, you and I are on the same page, man. Networking got me to meet Kamal. Yeah. But the, the other thing I want to say, and I'll finish on this, is that what, what you're aware of is what you manifest. So Kamal's been out there for 20 years. How come all of a sudden now I decided to go look for her? It's because I you taught my subconscious mind about what my dream and vision was writing a book. I got positive, and I started manifesting ideas about how I should go out and find those people that can help me. That's really interesting. So this year, 2018, I don't know why I started doing this. It wasn't a new year's resolution or anything like that, but I started working out every single day. Right. So I've changed this habit. I, I've, uh, in growing up, I was a very fit athlete, two or three sports a year was very, yeah. very, should have swim in college type of thing. Like very good athlete. Then I went to school, went to college, and it all went downhill, basically. And for the last 10, 12 years, I've been on again, off again. But this year, I've been working out a lot. Um, what's interesting, though, is that so now I create this new habit where I work out every day. Like after our call of this, I'll probably go to the, the, the local yeah. YMCA swim, swim a mile. I now, because I found a way to um, listen and consume books and podcasts, I'm doing that while I work out. Similar to you, when you're... Um, cooking or, or cleaning or just around the house. So I can download a book, put it on this waterproof iPod and work out with it, right? That's Doing cool. two things at once. So I probably read 25 books now this, uh, this year. Not one of them has been read except for my own book, like 17 times probably. Um, <laughs> by the way, I'm sure that that was hard for you to reading your book over and over again, trying to like, Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot easier when it's formatted. I'll tell you that. But I'm doing all these other things now and I have so much more time where before I couldn't find the time, but now I have all this extra time. So it's, it's interesting that that happened. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I, I, it was interesting. Um, I have <laughs> a, was. when you go to a networking event, most people ask, most people look the same. And most people ask you the exact same question. Oh, hello, Tom, what do you do? And I can't stand that question. Right. Um, because number one, it's not being the anomaly. Uh, and number two, I think it's trying to force a short, short term goal, which look, we're all in business. We all want to make a sale of something. Right. But I believe that we should be building relationships. So I try and spin it on something like, oh, are you a Seahawks fan? Right. Because you're wearing the hat or the one that I've been using a lot recently is, oh, what are you watching on Netflix? Right. Because I believe that you can connect to someone and, and 
try not to do it around the thing that they probably don't want to talk about anyway. They want to talk about their life and things that are personal. And people love to binge Netflix. So do you have like a go-to icebreaker question that's a little different uh, than just the standard, oh, what do you do type of thing? Yeah. Wow. That's uh, Did you say Seahawks or football? or some... No, you said Netflix. How did I think about Seahawks? <laughs> well, I said Seahawks because your hat. Okay, good, because I was saying you must see my hat. Uh, by the way, it's camouflage. It's a bit of a metaphor for the warrior. Mm-hmm. And, but I love the Seahawks. We used to travel down. We still do to see them. I remember games taking my kids. Awesome stadium down there. Yeah, going back to networking. So I want to pull in the science here because this is where I'm freak flag. I'm different. My answer is a little bit bigger than just a, 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 a quick answer, if it's okay. Um, so I've learned through the work I do with personality science that there's one personality in the four that if you approach them and try to talk to them, they'll run away from you. They're wired for the, the motive of peace. And so talking to them, if they're not ready, can actually have them retreat and cause them pain, like sticking the ice pick in their eye. It's that painful. My daughter's that personality, by the way. So if she's standing in a room and you go up to her and say, so do you like Netflix? She'll start retreating and you'll have broken rapport. Um, and so what I've learned just through some personality science is I've learned to read people's body language ahead of time and try to figure out a little bit about what I think they might be. So not everybody will know that. So you asked me the question, what do I do? Um, I, uh, I learned when I was 21 years old, and I'll tell you this quick story. I was a loan officer. So my career started in banking, as I mentioned. I was a loans officer at 21, wasn't married, didn't have kids. And guess what branch I worked in? It was a large trust company here in Vancouver, their downtown office. And that's where all the lawyers and accountants and professionals came to borrow money and commercially. So my clientele, Zach, were like 40, 50, 60 year olds. And I was petrified about networking and talking to people because the first thing I thought is I don't have kids. I don't have any experience. I don't have any wisdom. So one day I went out for lunch with a mentor and he said, form. I said, what do you mean? He said, F-O-R-M. I said, what do you mean? He said, F is friends, O is occupation, R is recreation, and M, I can never remember what it stands for. So what I do when I'm networking is I use form and I pick, I I do what you did, but I'll pick a question from one of those categories uh, to try to build rapport quickly, to try to make a connection. And the other thing I do is, and I learned this through sales because my life has been a lot about sales, even when I became an executive is uh, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of matching and mirroring, but when you're networking, the one thing people do is they walk right up to somebody, but if you have to, if you want to build rapport with somebody, which means connect to them in a way where they want to stay and talk to you and not run away, you have to only about two minutes to do that. And one way you break rapport is if somebody's standing here and you come up to them and you guys are standing and you step forward and you break that plane of comfort, you're, you're breaking rapport. Or, or if somebody is stand- – so by matching and mirroring, what I learned to do a long time ago is you match body language and you mirror tonality. So I started developing some skills around networking. So today when I meet something, the first thing I'll do is just observe a little bit about what, what they're doing. I'll go and match them. If they're holding a drink, I'll hold a drink if I have one. If they got their arms crossed, I'll cross my arms uh, if they're leaning one way. And uh, try this when you go out for lunch sometimes. Sit at a table with somebody, Zach, at lunch, a couple glasses of water. And then all of a sudden, grab your glass. If you want to know if you have rapport, grab your glass of water, take a sip, put it down. I guarantee you in 30 seconds, the other person will grab their water, put it down. Grab your your napkin, put it on your lap. They'll do the same thing. If you've matched them and you've established rapport, that's always going to happen. How how is that? Why is that happening? What's the psychological? Yeah, it's psychological because people want to fit in. And when somebody feels comfortable... Like I'm a trainer, professional trainer. In fact, I'm the CEO of Create, but I call myself the the lead trainer. So when I do my workshops, usually if it's 20, 30, 40 people, they're half-day workshops, I watch how the room fills up. When people come in the room, Zach, always the case. Usually one side of the room fills up faster first than the other. And why is that? Because psychologically, when people come into a room or come into a new company or sit down at a dinner with you, they want to fit in. They want to be like you. So they start matching and mirroring what you're doing. Unless they have a personality where they're kind of a little bit different, then maybe they'll go sit somewhere else. So it's kind of like when you're at a bar and there's no money in the, or the guy playing the guitar uh, on the street and there's no money in the tip jar. And so almost like 
you need to seed the tip jar so that there's some money in there so you don't feel like you're the only person doing it type of thing. So yep. people want to, yep. they flock to things. That's interesting. So last thing I want to tell you is when you and I first got on Skype, what I was doing is I started observing that you got a bunch of boxes behind you, which must be your cool book. <laughs> yeah, that or it's race car parts, which is would be cool too. But you got a bunch of boxes All and of stuff. All above. <laughs> and I was watching you and in my old self, which was an undisciplined, very in your face because of the rules I got from my childhood, would have been dominating, being assertive. Hey, how's it going? How's... But I sat back and I waited till you started talking. You said, how's your Thanksgiving? And I started mat- trying to match and mirror your tonality, your personality versus dominating because I knew if I dominated you in the first minute or two, I'd probably lose that rapport and it probably cost me in the interview too. Um, so that's kind of what I've taught myself. But networking is is not hard if you use form. And like you said, you pick a question out of that and you just learn to uh, match and mirror uh, tonality body language. Anybody can be like you. Mm, very cool. So is there a second book in you? There's two more. <laughs> okay. Are you working on those? In my mind, I, I honestly, we're still uh, promoting the first book but the second here's what happened in january dad died i want to can i tell you a bit about that do we, we have about a few minutes um it's hard to talk about it but i have to because it relates to the second book so for many many years i hadn't talked to or been connected to my dad for all the reasons i told you and um it was the biggest regret but through this journey my book actually brought me to forgiveness with my dad so last november we're last November. I reached out to my dad and I said, dad, my dad was reaching out to me. And this is one of the things that kids don't do very well. We don't reach up to our parents. Sometimes when we've had difficult beginnings, uh, parents aren't perfect. We make mistakes. And, uh, when we've had parents that aren't the greatest, we don't do a good job of reaching back up to them. We expect that they have to do all the reaching back. And so I reached out to my dad and I said, dad, let's have coffee at And we agreed to have coffee at Starbucks where he lives in a place called New Westminster, BC, British Columbia. We met for coffee. And I'm telling you, when I saw my dad, I didn't recognize him. He was this frail little guy, Indian guy. He had a goatee beard, gray hair, and uh, he was thinned out. And uh, we sat down. I was uncomfortable, but I said, hi, dad. And this is what he said to me. He looked at me and he said, son, he said, I love you. He said, I'm sorry for everything I did to you. He says, I release you. And I almost cried. I, I didn't know what to say to dad. I didn't, I, I, inside, I want to say, I love you too, dad. But part of me was just like this big weight coming on my shoulder. And then we just started talking. And at the end of that, we stood up and we took a selfie picture and I call it the selfie of dad. And, um, it's on my Facebook and it's the last picture I ever took with him because three, three months later at the end of the meeting, I said, dad, how about every month? I can't go fast, but how about every month we have coffee like this? And then he died. And if I hadn't reached out and connected with him, I would never, I would have regrets. And so when part of my book talks about this, the first book, but when I started connecting with dad, I asked my dad, dad, what's your story? And when I heard his story and he told me it, it was one night over a cup of coffee years before. When I heard his story, Zach, it was like looking at the man I could have been if I'd made those choices. You see, my dad was born in Fiji and his father was an alcoholic. And my dad was pushed off a bridge to learn to swim in Fiji. My dad's home was toxic and violent. My dad carried anger against my grandmother who died long ago. He told me that she used to manufacture alcohol just to keep his habit going. And then my dad saw his dad die at the dinner table from alcohol poisoning. And he became a man to young, at a young age, and he never had a childhood. When I finally realized that the belief systems and the rules and the things that were in my dad were a lot of why he was the way he is, and I heard his true story, I fell in love with him again. And so we went to this retreat, and uh, I had this epiphany, and this is true. I was lying in bed one morning. We went away for five days recently. You know about that, I told you. And I'm not spiritual, but I'm a Catholic. I was born and raised Catholic, and I was lying in bed. We were at this bed and breakfast. It was a cottage, and outside was like this beautiful gardens, and there was a waterfall, and then the ocean was close by. It's um, it's called Souk, British Columbia. And I went to bed, and it was September 30th, 
And I woke up the next day and my, I just wasn't right. And my wife was out wondering what was wrong and I was quiet and I went back to bed again. I was kind of feeling down and then I went to sleep and I woke up and I started getting emotional. I started crying and my wife comes, she says, what's wrong? And I said, I saw dad and I've never had this experience, but I actually, my dad spoke to me. He was like, we had this four poster bed. <laughs> he was speaking to me and, and I had this conversation and then it went away. And you know what? When I woke up, I went, holy shit, dad's birthday was yesterday. So my dad's birthday was the day before I had this connection with him in my mind. And throughout my life, I'd always never called him and wished him happy birthday. I blocked it. I wished, please don't call me and tell me to call dad because I didn't want to because I hated his story. So we went down to an ocean. My wife got some flowers. She's always amazing that way. She said, let's go say a prayer for your dad. So we bought some flowers and went down to the ocean. We put them in there. For the first time, I said, I said, dad, I miss you. And so I, I put a blog post out and it said something like, my dad's new birthday is September 30th. And that is going to be his new birthday because it's the day I finally appreciated that I actually loved him. I just didn't know it. So the next book, I know I was long-winded telling a story because it's part of it, was is going to be dad. The whole journey I did to create this book, the next book will be something based on dad died. What were the lessons and what am I doing now with this new power I have in the new life? Um, and then the, the third book, I don't know yet, but there's something in me that says there'll be two. You know, we just made the audio book for this first one. So uh, it'll come probably within the next year. I'm going to start writing that second book. What was the time frame from November of last year when you talked to your dad and reached out to him and had coffee and the time before that that you had last spoken with him? I mean, is there a long gap there? Yeah. In fact, a couple of years before that, I saw him at my wife's dad's funeral. He showed up unexpectedly. But prior to that, I hadn't seen him for maybe five, six years. Okay. So a really long time. Okay. So it's a good thing that you were able to connect that one last time. Yeah. If I can have any advice for your listeners or watchers, if you have any, res any res unresolved stuff with somebody in your life before it's too late, you know, reach up to them. And, and by the way, I'm not a fan of the religious preaching that, you know, you got to go forgive people. When, when you forgive somebody, you don't forgive their bad behavior. But by reaching up and hearing somebody's story, you're going to be able to learn about more about why maybe they developed themselves the way they did. And uh, seek forgiveness and mend fences. And that doesn't mean you have to be in their life, Zach. If, if somebody is that difficult, as long as you, you, know, you get together and you connect, you don't have to. You don't have to be in their life on their terms. That's powerful. So Tony Robbins, you guys are like on like text phone, text buddies or you get, you just went to one of his retreats. And... <laughs> yeah. He's my pal. He's sitting right here. Hey, Tony. No. Ah. <laughs> TR. Uh, well, in part of my discovery, I was telling you, I went and applied to be a real estate guy and I was sitting in a room doing a course and this guy comes in and starts promoting Tony Robbins. I'd heard about him. I didn't really know him. And so I went and did his Unleash the Power Within at the university here, and we did the firewalk. I mean, it was unbelievable. By the way, I come from uh, Roots, Fiji. There's a bunch of firewalkers in the South Pacific. So I did the firewalk, and uh, from there I did his Mastery University, well, Wealth Mastery and David Dessie. But the, the one program he has, and I'm not a, a – I don't get royalties or anything, but I'm not going to promote it. But if you go to Netflix, you may have heard about uh, I'm Not Your Guru. If you watch that, you cry watching it. It's unbelievable. But he's a real deal. But that's, I went on that experience for seven days. And that's what actually got me to change the meaning of my dad's bullshit story and started the journey of this whole thing. It was that, that little nugget. And uh, I joined the basket brigade, so I used to put uh, blankets and food in my car and at Christmas help you know, marginalized people. That's all the stuff Tony does. Uh, since then, though, I haven't really done any of his programs. But his uh, his teachings, by the way, taking nothing away from Tony because he's a real deal. But I always say to people, I, you know, I'm just as good as Tony. And I don't mean to say that arrogantly, but Tony had a story growing up on a, a bench, you know, marginalized. He started reading books, making tapes, and then he just absorbed everything and created his own vision of how he can help people. And so I took what he did and I said, well, I think I'm going to do that with my story. Um, he's built an empire. He's got, he's such a great guy and he's so talented, but for all those who are maybe, um, skeptical of Tony, a lot of what he does comes from science and the, the work that's already been done. He just can connect to people and he's figured out how to deliver it. 
His documentary on Netflix is incredible. I've watched it twice. Totally. <laughs> you will totally cry watching it. Like he's yeah. powerful. Um, and just an unbelievable, um, uh, just unbelievable documentary really getting in and uh, documenting a lot of the process. You said something interesting there about people, you know, being skeptical or whatever, uh, you know, I get it. I get why people are skeptical, but I believe that most people are just jealous and they're not willing to do the things that are necessary to get the job done. Right. So we all have goals. Probably we all want something, but what are you willing to do? It's kind of like we were talking about earlier when people were like, Oh, I, I didn't get this thing. Like, what have you done to, to deserve it? Right. What have you done to achieve that? Uh, and so you know, people might be um, jealous of Tony because he's gone to bat and hit a lot of um, hit a lot of balls to try and get to where he is, and uh, I, I appreciate that guy. And I really didn't know about much about him either until um, you know watching that documentary a year or two ago. But uh, incredible stuff. What's something about you that people don't know about? Well, I'll just show you. Uh oh. <laughs> so, can you see my tattoo there? Yep. That want well, to just put it back up again. So that's okay. I got that a couple of years. That's the that's the hero's journey narrative on my left shoulder, <laughs> and I have one on the other shoulder. It's actually the letter Q, and on, above it it says Tommy Gunn, and below it it says the Quiet Warrior, which is a metaphor from what I was and who I became. Uh, I never got a tattoo in my life because the rules were set by my 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 parents and society. You know, people look at you funny. So I guess that's that's uh, one thing, and. Uh, the other thing would be I was born on a military base, as I mentioned, in the backseat of a cab. I was premature and kind of came out in the cab halfway. So <laughs> my mom always says, that's that explains a lot, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, uh, the um, second part of the book, so it's called uh, The Way of the Quiet Warrior and then 90 Days to the Life You Desire. How long did it take for you to kind of figure out? We, we know how you figured out the, the quiet warrior start. Uh, um, part of it, but the the kind of tagline of it or the the second line of it. Yep. Um, well, I've been writing. I've probably been writing that book all my life since I was a kid. But the the actual process, the six steps, and we've registered it and trademarked it, so we own the IP now. That took eight years, which is really what's what's in what's weaved into that eight that six phase program is everything I learned on that journey, um, everything I did, everything every person I met. Um, all the courses I took, all the books I read, all the mistakes I made. And uh, that formula came together basically through that process. I can get into that. It's a bit, you know, it's in the book, but there's, six, sure. there's basically six steps. So. so how does one sell a book? How, how, well, how, what, what, like, how am what are, I doing what's it? The, yeah. What's working for you? Okay. And what's uh, maybe not working? probably easier to talk about what's not working. <laughs> the first thing I learned is that most, most authors, it's just what I know. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to agree. But the first thing I learned is from the author community, and I'm more than James, that most authors don't sell a lot of books. And I magically thought I'll write this book and make a lot of money. And that's not the truth. Unless you can be in the 1% or 2% it can kind of unlock the code. So how am I doing it? Well, it's the calling card for my business. So on my website, I have a suite of my services. Uh, so... Without getting into all of that, I've got one sheets on my website about the programs I have. So I have a 90-day coaching program, which starts actually here at the Terminal City Club. It's an immersion program. And I have two half-day workshops. Then I have uh, coaching and mentoring. And in every one of those one sheets and in all of my work, my book is packaged into it. So whenever I sell a workshop or I do a keynote talk, it's my book is actually packaged into the, the, the program. Um, I'm, a, I'm also a, a speaker, so I'll sell my books into my speaking gigs, and uh, people pay for it. Outside of that, I give a lot of books away. And so I, I was told, and this is part of what I learned through my journey, that being in service to others and gratitude, doing something for somebody. So a random act of kindness is like giving, give somebody a book. And I was, I was taught that if you sh you're going to give away more books than you sell. But that's going to – it's like network marketing. The more you tell the story about, about the plan you have in the company, later the gold will come. So in my first year, I bought 100 books. I know it's not a lot. It's, it's 100 books. And I, I networked and I gave a lot of my books away. And with those books, I asked for uh, them to read it and referrals, uh, testimonials. 
So I'm up to 115 reviews now. And, um, and through that has come referrals for uh, my other stuff. I'll also give a book away for, for, to give to somebody else. And so my books are moving through not only the work I'm doing and speaking, um, but I'm starting to now uh, do stuff for free with them. And uh, people are, are actually passing it on or passing the idea of Tom's book on, and people are going online and buying, buying the book themselves, plus the audio book has come out and we've, we've, uh, executives are busy. Uh, a lot of the people I, I have in my network don't have time to read. And so the audiobook's becoming sort of the tool of choice now for, for, uh, for my sales. So, so, I mean, it's early days, the mistakes. And I've for made. two smart people like you and me, right? <laughs> yeah, we exactly. love to listen to books. Yeah. By the way, I hired, we hired a voice actor out of Toronto, Canada, and it just, it blew the book up the doors off the book, man. It it actually came to life. I want you to get it. I'll gift you a code for it, but it blew it away because I read the book and I've had people say after they read it and then listened to it, it took it to a whole nother level because you're using another sense to, to take it in. I'm excited to do mine. I, um, I haven't voiced it yet, but I'm, I will be the voice and uh, I'm excited because I'm going to, I'm going to go on some tangents. And I can't <laughs> like, I, like writing some of the things, I'm like, I know I'm going to go on a tangent here. I cannot wait. Uh, so it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I can't wait for that. Anything that we haven't talked about that you want to? I guess I'm just going to leave you with one thought, and that is there was a study done in Canada of 90-year-olds, and the study was what were your three biggest regrets? And uh, true, they brought all the data together, and the top three regrets were one uh, – uh, didn't take enough risk, two, didn't reflect enough, and three, didn't make a big enough contribution. So I live my life now taking risk, you know, reflecting on on the past and, and uh, the gifts I have. And then, you know, being in service to other people, everything I do is about making a contribution. So I encourage everybody to to not have any regrets when they get to 90 years old. Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening to this entire episode of Zach Miller Says. It was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions or guests that you want to ask me or see me on the show, hit me up. You can just do it in the comments. Or email me, Z-A-C-K. That's me at startwithhatch.com. So Zach the A-C-K at S-T-A-R-T-W-I-T-H-H-A-T-C-H dot com. Now, my good friend Eric Olson is encouraging me to do these out cues, right? Usually when you're listening to these, the show just kind of ends abruptly. Why? Because it's weird and that's what anomalies do. But he really thinks that I should be upselling this bad boy, my brand new book, Anomaly, how to finally stand out from the crowd. Now, officially, the book comes out April 2nd of 2019. However, I've advanced copies. And if you want one of these bad boys, you can go to ZachMillerSays.com slash anomaly. That's A-N-O-M-A-L-Y. Or just check out the link in the show notes and you can get your advanced copy of the greatest book ever written, produced, and whatever other exciting word to describe it could be. I really appreciate you guys continuing to listen to the show, though. Uh, It means a lot to me. We've done hundreds of episodes. I really want to tell the stories of people, um, be very transparent in my solo episodes, my long-form interviews with people, trying to get stories that most people have not been able to get out of them. I think that's something that's super powerful and really provides great content. I love the stories that... I'm telling of, of the people that I interview. And then I also, you know, with these solo episodes, just really try to talk through and document what I'm currently going through. And so I appreciate you guys listening. Hey, and also one last thing after you grab the book, like cheesy plug for the book here. Ah, after you get the book, make sure you subscribe to the show and If you have a friend or following that you think would also enjoy the episode, share it with them as well. Because the more people that consume this, the more lives that we together can change. Ooh.
Look at that. Grab a book. Thank you all. Peace.